it's important for all of you guys who may come in contact with animals or may even come in contact with the water that animals are housed in to know a little bit about zoonotic disease. Uh, so zoonosis in general is an infection or a disease that can be transmitted from animals to humans under natural conditions. Um, this does not include, say, eating the animal. Uh, there's a whole lot more disease you can get from eating an animal. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just uh, the diseases you could catch from being in contact with the animals. Uh, there's also, we don't really have to worry about it much with fishes or with reptiles, uh, but there are also bidirectional zoonosis. Uh, that's a disease that can be transmitted not only from the animals to humans, but from humans back to the animals. Uh, a really good example of that are the new tamarins in the Just Add Water exhibit. So if you notice, uh, the, the trainers, when they go in there, those keepers are always wearing surgical masks. Uh, because those primates are so closely related to humans uh, that they can actually catch our colds uh, or our influenza or anything we might have. Uh, so that's an example of a bidirectional zoonosis. But most of what we're going to be talking about here are regular zoonoses. So you'll see here's zoonosis, that's one disease. Uh, zoonoses are plural uh, for zoonosis. Uh, zoonotic is also used to describe these diseases. It all kind of means the same thing. It all means a disease that can be transmitted from an animal to human. So it's obviously important to at least have an awareness of what types of diseases can be transmitted when you're working with animals. Um, so we're going to go briefly over the most common ones um, that could be applicable to our collection here at the Maritime Aquarium. Uh, so obviously we have a lot of fishes, we have a lot of invertebrates at the Maritime Aquarium, uh, but we also have reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, so we'll touch on those too. Uh, and then we'll briefly touch on occupational allergies, which are important to be aware of if you're handling uh, not only animals, but animal food. Um, briefly touch on venomous animals, uh, and also coliform bacteria. So to start out at the, the bottom of the food chain, as it were, with fishes and invertebrates, uh, there's, a, there's not a whole lot, because fishes are not super closely related to humans. Uh, so you don't have to worry about a whole lot of diseases uh, from being in contact with fish, but there are a few you need to think of. Uh, the first one is Mycobacterium marinum. Um, this causes uh, granulomas, which are really hard uh, infected spots, uh, abscesses, which is an open festering lesion, and ulcers that can persist for months. It's very, very hard to treat. Sometimes the course of antibiotics uh, for a Mycobacterium infection uh, can last nine months. Uh, Mycobacterium, uh, some of you guys may have heard uh, the term, the genus for this, this type of bacteria. Uh, is actually the same genus as tuberculosis. Uh, so it's sometimes called fish tank tuberculosis or fish tank granuloma when you see it in the literature. Um, in general, it's a very difficult bacteria to treat. Um, it's hard to clear these infections up. And you get these infections through broken skin. That being said, they are exceptionally rare. Most of the people that will ever have a problem with this are people that are already immune compromised, HIV positive individuals, people undergoing chemotherapy, um, people that really have a serious immune deficiency to begin with are susceptible to this. Um, all of these bacteria are in every body of water. Um, they're in the fish tank behind us, um, in, the, in the classroom, you know, they're in the touch tanks, they're in the seal tank, uh, they're in the sound, they're in the river, they're in every body of water. Um, we call them ubiquitous because they're all over the place. Um, it just really takes a special set of circumstances for somebody to come, come infected. Vibrio is another one. Uh, Vibrio, there's a whole bunch of different Vibrio species. They're very, very common in salt water, not in fresh water. Uh, these you may have heard referred to as flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, so when you hear flesh-eating bacteria, you're talking about Vibrio. Again, this is through, the only way you get this is through broken skin. If you put broken skin, you have a cut or something that goes into the water, uh, you, can, you can catch Vibrio. And again, it's mostly people that are immune compromised that have to worry about this. Uh, but if you ever do have uh, a cut or something, if you cut yourself on oyster reef out collecting, uh, and you start to notice red streaks moving upward from that cut, uh, that's a characteristic telltale sign that there's a Vibrio infection and you need to get medical attention right away. Uh, Aeromonas bacteria are the most common small infections we'll see. Uh, Aeromonas are everywhere, um, all over the place. Uh, very easy to pick up Aeromonas bacteria. Again, you get it through, uh, mostly through broken skin, you can get Aeromonas through contact with just the water or even with the fishes themselves. Uh, this isn't going to be a serious problem. It's not like the flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, usually it just causes redness and poor healing. Uh, if you'll notice, a lot of the aquarists, sometimes when they get cuts on their hands, uh, sometimes it takes those cuts weeks to heal, where a normal person, it heal in like a week. It's because our hands are always in water, 
uh, with Aeromonas and Streptococcus and some of these very common bacteria. It doesn't cause a, a life-threatening condition in most cases. It just leads to a little bit of redness and slow healing. Uh, the next one is Streptococcus INA. Uh, this is one that you get through contact with fish viscera, so the guts of fish. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful when you're prepping food to make sure you wash your hands afterwards, especially salmon uh, is where this is really known from. You can pick this up uh, through contact with fish viscera. Worst case scenario is it can cause serious infections. Most of the time uh, it's just going to cause a general diarrhea, but in really, really severe cases it can lead to infections of the heart uh, or systemic infections. It could be serious. And then last but not least with fishes we have salmonella. Um, salmonella, just like you worry about with reptiles and with raw chicken, um, is a, a bacteria that really has gastro inter, uh, gastrointestinal syndrome symptoms. Uh, you'll get diarrhea, vomiting, cramps uh, if you come in contact with this. Uh, and again, it's one of those bacteria that's all over the place. So moving up the food chain a little to reptiles and amphibians. Uh, you can see we have salmonella again. Salmonella is the most important bacteria that we have to think about with reptiles. Uh, that's why when we do dragon encounters or encounters with any kind of reptiles with the public, we always have hand sanitizer available uh, because most reptiles carry salmonella. And again, if somebody comes in contact with this and then puts their hand in their mouth, that can lead to some pretty nasty gastrointestinal problems. Uh, mycobacterium, we have mycobacterium species, just like in fishes, uh, again, related to tuberculosis, uh, that are in reptiles. Um, it's usually infection through broken skin. A lot of people that have gotten these uh, get scratched by a reptile, uh, and that, that little cut, they get a little bit of mycobacterium in there. And just like with fishes, it's a very, very difficult infection to acquire. Most people that get this are already immune compromised in some way, shape, or form. We have Aeromonas again because it's a ubiquitous bacteria. They're everywhere. Uh, again, it just causes poor healing and redness. Uh, with reptiles too, because they're a terrestrial animal, you can also get this with contact with the feces. We're not handling fish feces very often in animal keeping, uh, but of course with reptiles you are commonly, um, especially if you, uh, if you inhale it or you contact reptile feces with a broken cut, uh, you can get an infection that way. And then the one that a lot of people don't think about but are pretty common with reptiles are yeast infections. So candida is actually not a bacteria, it's a yeast, a fungus. Um, and you can actually get yeast infections of the skin uh, if you inhale this uh, through, you know, inhaling dust while you're cleaning an enclosure. Uh, or if you get scratched, you can get a, a minor yeast infection. Normally causes a little bit of dermatitis, you know, some redness, but it's not very severe. So birds. As we get into birds, we get into more, some more serious infections. Um, there's a number here that are unique to birds um, that you have to worry about when you're working with birds or cleaning their enclosures. Uh, Cryptococcus, crypt, crypt, Cryptococcus and Histoplasmosis uh, are the two most common. Uh, these are both infections that you get uh, through inhaling fecal particles. And of course you go, how would you breathe in fecal particles? Uh, but if you're cleaning a cage, let's say you go in there and you start sweeping really vigorous, uh, all that dry dust and stuff that gets in the air, you can breathe it in. If you take a hose and spray down animal feces, uh, some of that is getting aerosolized into the air. Uh, you may not see it, but you can breathe it in. So something to bear in mind when you're, anytime you're working with animal feces, uh, is that some of these, if you inhale them, can cause some issues. These causes fevers, coughing, chills, um, worrisome uh, symptoms, but not life-threatening symptoms uh, in most cases. Chlamydophila is another one. Uh, it's also called psittacosis. Um, Cytosine birds are the parrots. Uh, so this is a, another infection you can get through inhaling fecal particles, but specifically from the feces of parrots and macaws. Um, so that's one we obviously have to think about having cytosine birds in our collection. Uh, causes, in severe cases, pneumonia. Um, usually, again, not life-threatening unless the person is immune compromised. Uh, we have a mycobacterium species with birds as well. Um, it's also a very difficult infection to acquire, but it does happen in extreme cases. Uh, you get it through broken skin, uh, or if you're handling animal blood, um, is, is one way you can get it. Um, it causes night sweats, fevers, insomnia, and extreme weight loss. That's uh, more common to how tuberculosis presents in humans. Um, the tuberculosis species that infect birds actually start to cause, as you move closer up the food chain towards humans, you start to get more similar symptoms to human tuberculosis. And weight loss, unexplained long-term weight loss, fevers and night sweats are some of the common symptoms of tuberculosis. That's actually why it was uh, 
before it was well known, it was called consumption uh, because people just got consumed. They got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Uh, so that happens with bird mycobacterium as well. Uh, but again, just like all the other ones, not to scare you guys, it's incredibly difficult to acquire. Uh, but it does acquire, uh, occasionally happen. Another one linked here with birds uh, that we added at the very end is Cercarial Dermatitis, also called Swimmer's Itch. Uh, so this is one that you don't get from being in contact with birds. Uh, you get it from being in contact with water that birds have defecated in. Uh, it's really common here actually in the Long Island Sound. Uh, I moved here a year ago and I ended up with Swimmer's Itch within a month of getting here because I was out fishing um, in the Sound and picked up Swimmer's Itch. And what this actually is, is it's parasites of the bird. Uh, it's actually little worms that burrow into your skin. Uh, they're trying to find their final host. Humans are not their final hosts. Uh, so they try to infect humans. When the infection fails, you get a little red pustule uh, that may last for two to three weeks. It itches like crazy, uh, but it's not going to kill you. But it's cool to think that you have worms in your skin. Um, you can get this out saning. Like I said, it's really common here in the sound. Um, anytime you have, especially in the fall, when you have like lots of geese flying over and they're pooping in the water uh, and there's snails in the water, which are the other intermediate hosts, uh, you can get these types of infections from being in that water. So you could pick this up anytime, uh, but especially if you're in a pond where there's like lots of waterfowl or there's geese migrating. Just something to think about. If you go in the water and you end up with a bunch of red pustules that itch like crazy, that might be swimmer's itch. So finally, moving up to mammals, uh, there's a lot more for mammals, and I'll just kind of breeze through these. Um, this is mainly intended for the, the animal husbandry staff that work with the mammals, uh, but we're including it for you guys too because we are going to have some hedgehogs in the collection soon, and those hedgehogs are going to be used for education programs and animal presentations. Uh, as soon as the Utica Zoo sends them to us, uh, we'll put them through quarantine, and then we're going to have, uh, have some education mammals. So it's important that you guys know and of course, being very closely related to humans, uh, there's a lot more potential diseases you can get from a mammal. Uh, the first one is Campylobacter. Uh, Campylobacter is one you commonly get through contact with feces or contaminated water. Um, that's water that an animal has defecated in. Of course, animals go wherever they want. Um, so anytime you're working with, say, otter water or any of that, uh, the water from the seal pool, if they splash and it gets in your eye, you know, there's a, con a chance there you've contacted some of these bacteria species. Um, causes fever and bloody diarrhea, um, usually pretty, pretty, pretty short-lived. Uh, teliosis is firmites. Um, it's a temporary irritation. This is not a true zoonotic disease. You can pick up mites uh, from an animal just like you can pick up fleas from an animal, uh, but they're not going to infect a human. You're not going to pick up a case of fleas uh, and be plagued with it for months. Uh, they generally cause a little bit of irritation, when they realize they're not on the right species, they're not on their host, they drop off and it's no more problem. Same with fermites. Uh, Giardia lambia, beaver fever, is another one you can get through exposure to feces or contaminated water. Uh, we include this here because it's really, really common in otters, especially North American otters, like we have in our collection. But it's also another one to think of if you enjoy hiking, if you enjoy backpacking. Uh, this is why you filter your water uh, when you're out backpacking, because if you pick up Giardia, it will cause the worst diarrhea you've ever had in your life and it can last for weeks. Um, so it's really something you want to avoid uh, and it is a zoonotic disease that you get through com uh, contact with contaminated water. Uh, there's Pasteurella. Um, for the most part Pasteurella is something you think of in milk um, and of course all of our milk is pasteurized so we don't have to worry about it uh, but we do have it in seals. Uh, you can actually get it through their nasal secretions. Uh, and if you come in contact with it, it can cause redness and swelling, um, possibly leading to really severe swelling. Uh, but it's a pretty rare infection. Uh, there's ringworm. Everybody in their life has had ringworm at some point. It's not actually a worm, of course. It's actually just a fungal itch. Uh, it causes a little bit of dermatitis. Uh, but all mammals can carry ringworm. So if you have contact with an otter, a seal, a hedgehog, uh, no matter what it is, you could end up with ringworm. Um, rabies is the big one. Uh, rabies is a viral infection. Of course, it's 100% fatal if it's untreated to humans as well. Um, the only way to test for rabies in an animal is to cut the head off and biopsy the brain. Um, so that's why all of the staff that work with uh, the skunk and the other animals over in Just Add Water uh, that are common rabies vector species have had to o undergo a whole series of shots uh, to make sure that if that animal ever bites them, 
uh, that we don't have to put the animal down to confirm rabies. Um, rabies is a really, really important one. Uh, of course, we know all of our animals in the collection are rabies free, uh, but anytime you're dealing with, say, a wild skunk that wanders onto property or a raccoon uh, that's not acting right, uh, either here at the aquarium or even in your home life, you have to be really, really careful. Um, the vaccines have gotten really good, where even if you get bitten by a suspected rabbit animal that we can't uh, test for, uh, you can still get that series of vaccines even after the bite, and it's no longer like a bunch of big needles in the stomach like it used to be. It's just four little shots. Um, you can get that even after the bite and be safe from it, but it's important if you do get bit by an animal, uh, any wild animal, to report that so that you can get that promptly. Uh, because if you let it go too far, like I said, there's no cure and it's 100% fatal. Um, causes some really, really terrifying symptoms, including hallucinations, um, fear of impending death, parano paranoia, terror. Um, it's a really nasty one. Toxoplasmosis is a disease that most people think of uh, usually with uh, contact with, with cat feces or breathing in cat feces when you're cleaning the litter box. Most cats have toxoplasma. Um, Otters also have it, which is why I'm included here. Uh, but it's, it causes flu-like symptoms, you know, really bad cold, uh, headaches, chills, fevers, etc. Um, of course, we have a mycobacterium species, just like all the other groups. Uh, with the mammals, we have the same mycobacterium uh, that causes tuberculosis in humans. Uh, this is why all of the animal care staff get TB tested every single year uh, to make sure that we haven't acquired tuberculosis from any of the animals and also to make sure that the animals can acquire tuberculosis from us. It's a very rare disease now in the 21st century, uh, but it still is a very serious disease. And just like the other ones, it's very, very difficult to treat. It can take up to nine months on multiple antibiotics to treat mycobacterium. Uh, brucellosis is one that's, again, very commonly associated with milk, uh, but it's also associated with seals. Um, the only way you'll ever acquire a brucella in infection in seals is if you're exposed to an aborted fetus uh, or if you're doing a necropsy on a seal. Um, so most people will never come in contact with it, but it's one to be aware of. Ursipliothrix uh, is commonly believed to be, we still don't 100% know the cause of seal finger, uh, but Ursipliothrix is believed to be the bacterium responsible for seal finger. Uh, a lot of trainers that work with seals and sea lions uh, that have been bitten have had some really, really severe uh, reactions, long-term infections that even lead to the amputations of fingers or hands uh, later if they're not treated. Uh, so that's that's kind of what we call seal finger. It is a risk we deal with, uh, but again, it normally comes from a bite uh, or if you're doing a necropsy. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it is it'll cause diamond-shaped lesions uh, on the skin. Um, Leptospira is another one from expo exposure to urine, uh, causes chills, headaches, uh, gastric distress, etc. Mycoplasma is another one implicated in seal finger. Um, like I said, we don't 100% know what the cause of seal finger is. It could be multiple bacteriums. Uh, but mycoplasma is another one. The mycoplasma are not quite bacteria. Uh, they're not quite a fungus. We really don't know what they are. They're interesting organisms. Uh, but this could be one of the ones that leads to inflammation and redness. Uh, could eventually lead to you having to have that limb amputated. But again, only if you're doing a necropsy or you get bit by a, a marine mammal will you come in contact with this. Uh, there's scabies. Uh, Sarcoptes scabi are uh, scarcoptic mange, another little crustacean uh, that drops off of animals. Again, this is like the, the mites. This is one that's not a true zoonotic disease, but you can get it through contact with mammals. It may cause a little irritation, uh, but it, it won't last for long. It usually doesn't even need treatment. Uh, and then the last but not least, are, uh, raccoon roundworms. Um, these are fairly rare. We put it in here because we were originally going to have raccoons in Just Add Water. Uh, we ended up deciding against it, one with the porcupine instead. Uh, but they actually have a, a parasitic roundworm, a nematode, uh, that you can get just through contact with the soil. Uh, so if that raccoon defecates on the soil and you walk on it barefoot, you can actually get this guy. Um, it's fairly rare, but when you get this parasite, it can cause some really nasty side effects like severe pain, uh, spasms, uh, can even lead to death. But again, it's an exceedingly rare parasite. So how do I prevent all these? That's kind of all the doom and gloom. This is everything that could potentially harm you in the aquarium. How do you prevent it? Obviously the most important thing is to wash your hands. That's why we have hand washing stations. 
by all the touch tanks, uh, washing your hands uh, after you encounter an animal, encounter water from an animal, animal feces, animal food bowls, anything like that is the number one thing you can do to prevent any zoonotic disease transmission. Uh, it's especially important if you've been handling animals uh, to wash your hands before you go to lunch or before you go home and cook dinner. Um, so that's kind of common sense, but hand washing is absolutely the best preventative. 99.9% .9 of all zoonotic diseases uh, that have happened in zoos and aquariums have happened because of improper hand washing. PPE. Um, if you have a cut on your hands um, or anything, you should be wearing some kind of PPE if you're handling um, not only animals but animal water or you're handling uh, food fish to, to prepare for animals. Uh, you should wear gloves if you have open cuts on your hands. Um, if you're working with something like birds or mammals, uh, there may be other specialized requirements. Remember a lot of those were con were contracted through exposure to animal feces, breathing in dust from animal feces, so that's why masks are very important if you're working with, uh, say, bird feces. Uh, and again, anytime you're working with quarantine or sick animals, uh, you should wear gloves automatically just to protect yourself and to protect the animal. Uh, again, masks for birds, uh, for mammal feces, uh, anytime you're cleaning down enclosures, uh, masks can be very important. Uh, we only have a couple uh, animals, the tamarins are the most notable example, uh, that we require the staff to wear masks when they go in the enclosure for these types of reasons. So then we're on to a few other occupational hazards. It's not just diseases you can catch, uh, but we also want to make sure you guys have an understanding of some of the other hazards uh, to working with animals in the aquarium. Uh, one of the most common is shellfish allergy. Um, a growing number of people in the country actually have shellfish allergy. Many of them never know it until they handle shrimp uh, or crabs or mollusks for the first time. It can cause severe redness and swelling of the skin and the hands, uh, sometimes the face and the eyes. Uh, it can cause difficulty breathing. Of course, anytime you think you're having an allergic reaction, uh, make sure you uh, alert your supervisor and get, seek medical attention because uh, anaphylactic shock is no joke. Uh, if you think you're having a severe allergic reaction, you need to seek medical attention. Um, and of course, if you know you have a shellfish allergy and you're, part of your job duties are to, say, prep shrimp to feed to animals, uh, you need to make sure you're carrying an EpiPen prescribed by your doctor. Uh, there's also another one. Um, I don't think you guys feed a lot of bloodworms to the, the animals. It's mostly a freshwater fish food. Um, but bloodworm-induced asthma is another problem. Bloodworms are a common, as I said, fish food for freshwater fishes. Um, but if you breathe in the dust from bloodworms, most people, like you have a cutting board or a, a dish, and you go to spray it off when you do the dishes, you aerosolize that and bring it in, people will actually get an asthma attack from that. Um, and a lot of people will never know they had this allergy until the first time it happens. Uh, some aquarists have worked with bloodworms for years before they happen to wash down that bowl and breathe in the, the mist and realize they have a really severe bloodworm allergy. Uh, so it's something to think about. Uh, venomous animals too, we obviously have a number of venomous animals in the building. Uh, we don't have anything venomous that we would consider a dangerous animal. We don't have any uh, we don't have any hot snakes in the building, anything like that. But we have, do have a few species that do have the capability to envenomate you. Um, jellyfishes are obviously one. Uh, octopods are another one. Uh, there's a number of catfish species scattered throughout the building. Most of the catfishes carry some kind of venom. Uh, it's usually in the dorsal spines. Um, lionfish are a big example. We have the lionfish display down in the jelly exhibit. Uh, lionfish can cause a very nasty sting. Uh, and so can scorpion fishes. We don't have any scorpion fishes right now, uh, but there will be some scorpion fishes coming in uh, in the new exhibit going across from the shark ray touch pool, including the stonefish, which is the one deadly scorpion fish uh, that are going to be going in there next year. Uh, of course, there's also the snakes, but again, we don't have any hot snakes here, too. Uh, we don't have any of the really dangerous octopods like the blue ring octopods. Um, we also don't have cone snails at the moment. Cone snails are just as deadly as blue ring octopods. Uh, but we will have them next year in the new exhibit across from the web tank where the old camo tank was. Um, jellyfish stings. Uh, of course, we do have a number of jellyfish in the building, and we have a jellyfish touch tank. Uh, of course, we only have moon jellies in there because we know that they cannot sting most people because of the thickness of our skin. Um, but the toxins associated with jellyfish nematocysts can easily be neutralized with vinegar or with meat tenderizer in a pinch. Um, the old wives' tale about urinating on a, a jellyfish sting uh, really isn't great advice. Uh, there is some ammonia in urine, uh, but it's not in the form of ammonia, it's in the form of urea, so it won't do much for a jellyfish sting. So if you ever get stung when you're out of the beach, 
uh, don't let anybody tell you they should pee on it. It's <laughs> never a good idea. Um, if you do get a jellyfish sting, you should put on nitro gloves to make sure you don't spread those nematocysts around any further. There could be nematocysts that have not fired attached to your skin, uh, and you don't want to sting yourself further. Uh, you can spray it with vinegar and give it some time to work, and then you can neutralize that with baking soda uh, and scrape it off with a plastic knife or a credit card to remove any of those nematocysts. Octopod bites. Uh, all octopods are venomous, including our giant Pacific octopus. Uh, most of them are not very nasty, uh, but of course there are the, the three species of blue ring octopus that are deadly. Uh, and those are really deadly. They can kill you within uh, five minutes of being bitten. Uh, we don't have those in the collection. We don't have any plans to have those in the collection in the near future. Uh, if you ever get bit by an octopus, and most people will never get bit by an octopus, uh, but if you ever do, uh, the first aid is very easy. It's the same as for a lionfish sting uh, or a scorpion fish sting. Just run it under hot water for 30 to 90 minutes, and the heat will denature the venom. Um, venomous fish stings, again, we have lionfish. Uh, we will have stonefish next year. Uh, first aid is the same for one of these stings. Depending on the species, it can range from being very mild, like a bee sting, uh, to very severe, uh, with pain and headache and nausea. Um, but the, the first aid is the same for all of them. Uh, if you get stung by a venomous fish, uh, the first aid is to run it under hot water. Uh, 30 to 90 minutes is recommended, uh, just to make sure you denature that venom. Stingray envenomations. Um, of course, we trim all the barbs of the stingrays in the, in the touch pool. Um, but stingray envenomations do occasionally occur. Um, it's obviously a, a one in a million shot to get a dangerous stingray envenomation, uh, especially in our pool where the barbs are trimmed. Uh, but if you ever find yourself getting stung by a stingray, uh, if the barb remains in your body, if it stings you in the leg and the barb is still there, do not pull it out. Seek medical attention for that. Um, you can get nasty infections from a stingray barb. Uh, after the fact, so even after you get medical treatment, you can have a nasty infection from it. A lot of those will be those Vibrio, those flesh-eating bacteria, um, but you usually get antibiotics for it. But again, first aid is the same. If you get a mild stingray sting, uh, first aid is to run it under hot water and that will denature the venom. Last but not least, coliforms are something you should always think about when working with animals in water. Uh, coliform bacteria gets its name from E. coli. Um, e. coli has been in the news a lot lately with the romaine lettuce recall, uh, but E. coli basically is one type of bacteria uh, that is used as an indicator species to indicate the presence of fecal contamination. Um, so coliform bacteria are all of the hundreds of bacteria that indicate fecal contamination. Um, they, we have certain thresholds we, we monitor and, and maintain the tank set. Uh, for marine mammals, the USDA rec requires us uh, to keep the coliform bacteria le less than 1,000 cells per 100 milliliters of water. And I can tell you that in the seal pool, they never even get close to a tenth of that high. Uh, we, it's almost always zero or very, very close to zero. I don't think they ever go over 100. Uh, but the limit is 1,000. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service requires the same threshold for sea turtles. Uh, so in all the sea turtle exhibits, uh, we're, we keep them well under 1,000 uh, cells per 100 mils of water. And again, uh, here with proper filtration and sterilization, they never get anywhere close to that. Um, in Connecticut, uh, the allowable amount of coliform bacteria in your beach and swimming waters, uh, so down at Calf Pasture Beach, the maximum amount of fecal contamination uh, that the state will allow in that water is 235 cells per 100 mils. Uh, so a little under one quarter of that limit. Um, while we have a much higher limit for the, the mammals and the sea turtles here at the aquarium that we never come close to, uh, a lot of the beaches in Connecticut do unfortunately often come very close or over the limit and they have to close the beaches to swimming. Uh, anytime you see a beach close to swimming, it's almost always because of this. Uh, but it's something to think about. Anytime you have animals defecating in water, um, not only are there the diseases, but there's also the bacteria like E. coli that can make you sick. Um, and it causes diarrhea, gastric distress, vomiting. Um, all of the usual symptoms you would expect from E. coli. Um, but that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you guys for suffering through that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>